Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Pastor Bob Miller. Let me add my welcome to you all worshiping here in this space, all of you worshiping in the, the spaces that you are occupying right now as you, we all connect uh, live, online, uh, worshiping God. Um, oh, by the way, happy Mother's Day. Today's happy yeah, Mother's Day. I did a little research. The... Uh, Mother's Day is, is, is kind of around the world, but it's not always the same, you know, depending on where you go. The American tradition of Mother's Day actually got its start in the, the early 1900s. It was, it was a liturgical service of worship at Andrews Methodist Episcopal Church in Grafton, West Virginia. Now, Mother's Day um, was then and still is more of a secular holiday, celebrating um, it's aimed at celebrating what mothering, if you will, means in our lives. And I say mothering because I believe that mothers come in all different forms. And here I'm not talking about shapes and sizes. What I mean is, is there are biological mothers. For every one of us had a biological mother. And for many of us, those biological mothers... Uh, were very significant in us becoming who we are today. But also for many of us, the person that we think of as mother, we may not be biologically connected to, but they still fulfill that role of mother in our lives. But as well, most of us also have benefited from women who were not mother by label, but who also gave of themselves for our well-being. And I personally am so grateful for all the women who have in some way mothered me and contributed to, to who I am today. And so peace to all of you who have or are fulfilling such a role. Peace to all of you who have someone in your life who still fulfills that role. And peace to all of you who are honoring that person today in memory. Now, one of the attributes that I've recognized by observing mothers over, well, over my whole life, especially as an adult, is that they are prone to give it their all. They go without sleep. They clean up all kinds of messy things, sometimes really messy things. They teach. They're always thinking of the other person. They, they attend school meetings and school activities. They take us to, to doctors. They, they sacrifice. And they do all that. They, they give out of their deep and unconditional love. And while I think that it's most easily observed in those with the, the, the mother label, I believe it can also be seen in, in the other forms of those who mother us. But either way, I think a big takeaway is that there's definitely a link between love and giving it one's all. And while mothers help us to, to see that linkage, I think it applies to to much more than, than only mothers. For example, in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, let me give you a little background. This, this takes place just before Jesus' final entry into Jerusalem and, and his crucifixion and, and, of course, his resurrection. And there's a, there's a public meal that's held in his honor by, by Jesus' friend Lazarus and Lazarus's, Lazarus's, you try saying that three times, two sisters, Mary and Martha. Hear what happens. Please read along as I read aloud. Six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, home of Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Lazarus and his sisters hosted a dinner for him. Martha served and Lazarus was among those who joined him at the table. Then Mary took an extraordinary amount, almost three quarters of a pound, of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. 
She anointed Jesus' feet with it, then wiped his feet dry with her hair. The house was filled with the aroma of the perfume. Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, Jesus' disciples, the one who was about to betray him, complained. This perfume was worth a year's wages. Why wasn't it sold and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He carried the money bag and would take what was in it. Then Jesus said, leave her alone. This perfume was to be used in preparation for my burial, and this is how she has used it. You will always have the poor among you, but you won't always have me. Now this, this nard that Mary anointed Jesus' feet with, is a, it's like an oil-like perfume that's extracted from the, the roots and the, the flower clusters of a particular plant that's only grown in East Asia. This nard that is talked about here is almost assuredly what was imported from India. It's definitely not one of those lower quality brands that sold at the local supermarket. So this stuff is very pricey. A flask of it would have typically contained less than an ounce and would only have been used for, for very special and rare occasions. So three quarters of a pound would have had an enormous value and represented a substantial act of giving. And quite admittedly, given the, the pervasive poverty and the, and the difficulty that the people in Jesus' time and in that area were experiencing, our having some sympathy with Judas' position would not be entirely misplaced. However, as, as John reveals, Judas's real motives were less than altruistic. What, what the gospel writer knew when he wrote this, and, and what Jesus would have definitely known at the time, is that as treasurer, Judas was not above helping himself to some of those revenues that were in his charge. And so such a valuable piece of merchandise, all of this pure nard, would have given Judas quite an opportunity to line his pockets. Now, we can have a field day deep-diving Judas and his motivations and his, his treachery to both Jesus' trust and Jesus' life. But as illustrative and instructive as that would be, I think more salient to our conversation today is the contrast between Judas's response and Mary's actions. Because Judas's response was informed, it was driven by his self-interest. Whereas Mary's actions, on the other hand, were, were a result of her deep, genuine, unconditional, selfless love for Jesus. Judas responded in deceit and personal gain Mary gave openly and sacrificially in love. Which, such giving, quite frankly, is not a hard concept for us to grasp. It, it, I think, in fact, it, it is, it's quite natural for us. It, stop and think. When you really love someone, you want to do anything, everything you can for them. You're willing to to stay up a little longer, work a little harder, dress a little nicer, keep the house a little cleaner. You're willing to give up a little more, or we're willing to give up a little more of what we want in order to give them more of what they want. And that goes for all, you know whatever the nature of love we're talking about. You, you, you'll probably remember that Pastor Susie last week talked about four kinds of love that we, that we read about in Scripture. Each of those kinds of love have their own Greek word, but English translators use the word love for, for all of them. Uh, there's storge, which represents a, a familial bond, a bond, you know, for families. Uh, philia is a friend bond. Eros is a, is a romantic bond. And agape 
unconditional God love. But regardless of the particular type of love, whether it's family, friend, romantic, God-like, we are still driven to give it our all when our love is deep and genuine. Would you agree? Yeah. Each, each type of love, then, is, is able to, to take on elements of being unconditional and, and sacrificial when our love is that deep and, and genuine. So, so can, do you see what I mean when I say that there's definitely a linkage between love and giving it one's all? In many ways, it's, it's an act of surrender to that love. Moms do it. Well, parents do it, right? But also coaches do it. Teachers do it. Doctors do it. Firemen do it. Policemen do it. Police women also do it. We all do it when we're talking about that level of love. We, we sacrifice our sleep, our free time, our hobbies, our energies, our money. Maybe not giving up all of, of, of any of those things, but, but, we, but definitely a, a recognizable amount of it. We, we sacrifice things that are in some way valuable to us because of our love for the other that we value even more. We sacrifice our time our money, our energy, our brain power when we are courting someone we love, in our marriage with the person we love, in our raising of a family with those persons we love, but also when we mentor, when we teach, when we quilt, when we serve, when we offer our lives to greater causes. We freely offer or give that which we value for the sake of our love. And again, that should not come as any surprise to us, especially as followers of Christ. For I submit that we naturally do that out of divine design. Because just think about how God gave God's all by giving Jesus Christ, giving us Jesus Christ, the God's very essence in the flesh, who through sacrifice ultimately offers us eternal salvation through Christ. And God gave God's all, something I think arguably very valuable to God, all because God deeply, genuinely, unconditionally loves us. And God intentionally created us in God's own image that we, at least when we are at our best, may reflect that same way of God in how we live. So, God gives it God's all, but God also wants it all from us who God gives it all to. God wants us to demonstrate our love and our trust and our uninhibited openness to God's working within us so that God can more actively love us. And here I'm talking about love as a verb because feelings without actions our feelings unmanifested. And so when we give it all, our all, lovingly, sacrificially, we do goodness out of deep and genuine love. And as we do, we reflect God's love-based sacrificial giving, which demonstrates our love and trust in God. A little side note, though. With God, giving our all means giving our all. Not only the things that we value, but also the things we struggle with or the things we're in need of 
or our concerns, our hurts, our pains, our fears. God wants us to give it all when it comes to God. The good and the bad. The happy and the sad. Which actually should also not come as, as a surprise. Because just like as w- when we grow in our love with people, we grow into that space where we are able to share with them our fears, our hurts, our pains. And we come to know that we're not alone. We come to know that we have a companion to share all of life with. And it's awesome when our love eventually gets there with friends, with spouses, with soulmates, sometimes even with our children. Basically, it says that when when we trust in that love enough to give it our all, That is, when when we're talking about God, is when we trust God enough to lift our needs into God's care. Boy, I covered a lot of ground here, didn't I? You'll have to go back and listen to the sermon online. But it all leads back to embracing love and letting that love lead to giving it your all. Sacrificially offering that which you value because of your deep and genuine love. So, friends, what do you value in your life? And how might you make use of whatever that is to honor God because of your love for God? Maybe your time? that you can, can give of, your, of yourself in conversation or in service. And maybe some knowledge that, that you might be able to use that you have that can help someone in need. Maybe it's a valuable skill or, or ability that can somehow bring comfort to others or make someone else's life easier. <laughs> it might involve your car. Those are pretty valuable. That you might make it possible for someone to get to church or get to a doctor's appointment, or get to the grocery store, or maybe just receive a visit from a friendly face. It may be downright muscle power that you can put to work in in beautifying, fortifying, making some place safe and secure. In other words, something valuable to you that you may surrender openly and sacrificially giving it your all. And in so doing, tangibly manifesting the loving, sacrificial presence of God. May it be so. Amen? Amen. Amen.